those sort of things can never get sorted out if we're tied to percentage increases every year with no flexibility at all. And yet, the real flexibility is coming from advanced fares, which the minister tells me through Julian only today, are nothing to do with the government. They're entirely set by the train operating companies, and actually, they offer some of the best deals for passengers. It, it's completely chaotic, unless there's some attempt to, for, for politicians to step back from day-to-day -day management affairs to try and get a rational fare structure across the industry. Thank you very much, Ron. I meant to mention the ossification of the fare structure <laughs> in my introduction, but I had so much to cover, I didn't manage to get around to it. But thank you very much for bringing it up, by the way, that I've got to again. Um, yes? I think there's one quick observation. Name, this talk about what's so, sorry, name. So this, that Chris Rail Future. Rail Future. 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 Um, this business of privatisation and nationalisation and so on. I wonder just how privatised the railway actually is. <laughs> Network Rail, by admission tonight, is entirely private. It's nationalised now. The Department for Transport absolutely prescribes what any train operator is going to do. They're, they have flexibility up to a point of what they can do with some of the affairs, as has been pointed out. But, you know, how privatised are we? Is there nothing wrong with actually employing private groups of the top management to submit a franchise bid and run that franchise with the aim of reducing the cost to the taxpayer, if it can be done? We've seen some pretty ghastly examples when it wasn't done. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily undermine the principle of the thing. Now, I know some of you won't agree with that view. But I think we need to think less about the structure, but getting better value out of the structure we have, both from network rail, equipping much more effectively and working much more efficiently to mechanise and automate the operation of the railway. And then on the operating side, for the TOCs, maybe to give them a little bit more flexibility, not necessarily to hang themselves, but to provide us with a little more clarity on what is possible on their tickets without spending uh, going into almost research grant status to find out what the information is to be. Alright, thank you. Yes, I, I agree with you that the, this um, nationalisation, privatisation of it is a fairly populist debate which hasn't really, doesn't really go very deep into yeah. the structure of the railway. Uh, yes? Um, and Greg Hudson, somebody will probably be dead before all these improvements come. <laughs> um, I have here uh, tickets for DB Rail for a journey from Cologne to Brussels and the fare one way with a reserved seat and at seat catering was four and a half euros. <laughs> right? There are the tickets printed. Four and a half euros. I mean, this <laughs> Um, uh, about modernising the infrastructure was a point I mentioned um, earlier. We um, uh, have invested a huge amount not only in enhancing capacity but um, in, in um, renewing and stabilising the assets and we've now got a programme that we call the Digital Railway that we're beginning to develop which is uh, absolutely about um, putting much more modern technology in place to replace the Victorian um, architecture that's there. Um, but it won't happen overnight, and we need to um, we need to make the case for it, um, which requires a lot of a lot of detailed analysis. Um, do you want to say anything about the homogenisation of the fares? Yes, uh, but I did want to yes. very briefly pick up on the nationalisation and privatisation because actually Passenger Focus did carry out some research a couple of years ago, something that we termed passenger power, asking people how much they wanted to be involved in the railways and those sort of questions. And basically passengers are saying they don't care who runs the railway. Yeah. What they want is punctual, reliable services, coming back to my main point. On the whole area of um, ticketing, uh, we fairly recently did a piece of work called Ticket to Ride, all around penalty fares and how much really there are many passengers who make 
mistakes on tickets because they're far too complex. Not that we contain, uh, condone fair evasion, that's absolutely not the case on this, but there are people who make genuine mistakes and a lot of that is down to far too much confusion around ticketing and why should it be that complex really for, for passengers. Uh, do, you, do you want to say anything about any of that? Uh, just to say that uh, it seems, it, I mean, the, the, the flex issue it seems to be uh, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a fair, uh, fair issue. The uh, difference between fares between down in March and March was even greater before I became eligible for a, a senior rail car <laughs> because you could use a, a, a network rail car to down in market but not to March. Uh, and uh, uh, and, and, and for that reason, now, uh, 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 I mean, for example, if you want to go to, if you want to, go to Whiz Beach, it's easier to use, it was cheaper to use King's Lynn as a rail <laughs> than to use March as a rail uh, But, uh, uh, I mean, I, I would suggest that what, that what, that what happens is that, uh, is that, uh, uh, that uh, there should be a sort of uh, a, a, a definite program to harmonize, to harmonize uh, Rail, uh, rail fares and uh, and the flex should be clearly seen to be moving in, in that direction. 